Hello everyone and welcome to this new video series. We're going to discuss the domination of the opponent species, how to how to dominate uh, opponent species and when you manage this, how to take advantage of this. So a very good example of that is a brilliant victory by the best French player ever, Maxime Vachelagrave, against Ding Liren, the best Chinese player. That game was played in Paris at the Memorial Alikin in 2013. So it was a Karokan defense and MVL choose a very aggressive line H4, which is quite popular. When it was invented, actually, uh, it raised a lot in popularity because it's really a fre it was really a fresh idea. But even now that it's been played thousands of times, it's still being played quite often because it's actually a very interesting variation. So let me just basically explain the idea. So first of all, black cannot play e6 as he would normally do against almost any move because after g4 he would lose the bishop because of the pawn that is already on h4. So that means he basically has a choice to play h5, which is a main line, but give away an important square on g5. Usually white is going to put the bishop there. For example, when black plays e6, then bishop g5. I mean, here, for example, there could be bishop d3, and then bishop g5, and then some c4, knight d2. And we're quite happy with the square on g5. Still, h5 is, I think, the most real, realable move, but okay, we're not here to discuss uh, theory, of course. And h6 is the other option, but after g4, and this is what happened in the game, black is a uh, tough uh, decision to make, or to play a passive move, say, retract the bishop to d7 or c8, which is not what you want to do when you play the Karokan, otherwise you'd rather play the French defense. Or to keep the bishop on that diagonal, but then you're going to allow white to push uh, on that diagonal, sorry, but then you're going to allow white to push e6. And this is what happened in the game. Ding Liren did it in a quite clever way. He first played bishop e4 and then went to h7. So what is the idea? So of course white played e6, because if, if black manages to play e6, then he gets a very reasonable caro can when white only he played pawn moves which is not something you generally advise to people so e6 is definitely the idea and it's very good for black i mean it's much better it's a much better version for black with a pawn on f3 than f2 because it will be much more difficult for white to bring a knight to e5 and that that does make an important difference in the game black played knight f6 and Maxim played a very clever move, bishop f4, to prevent queen d6. That would, could have been quite annoying with perhaps some strats here, but especially, uh, try, I mean, queen, queen d6 would especially force white to make a decision with his, his pawn on e6. And actually taking on f7 and, and castling the black king could turn out to be something quite good for black because then e5 could come very quickly and it could turn out that actually the white king is weaker than the black one. So bishop f4 is a very clever move to keep black a little bit paralyzed. And we can already, I mean, already here, we can start to see what's going to happen to, to these pieces on the king's side, you know? I mean, you know that we're going to talk about domination and I'm pretty sure you already guessed more or less what pieces are going to end up being uh, dominated. So anyway, knight f6, bishop f4, very clever move. Queen b6 was played by Ding Liren to put pressure on the b2 pawn, and Maxim sacrificed the pawn with knight c3, queen b2. You may wonder what white is going, is doing here. Is he just gave a pawn? His knight is hanging. The pawn on c2 is hanging. The pawn on e6 is also hanging. So you may wonder what he is doing, but actually he just played king d2, protecting both of these uh, things. And after queen b6, back knight e2 protecting d4 and now he's going to enjoy some activity on the b5. He's actually already threatening rook b1 with big problems on the b7 pawn. So Ding played a6 with the idea to put the queen on a7 and keep the b7 pawn protected uh, as losing the b7 pawn would be quite dramatic. Knight a4, threatening knight b6. So black played b5, Maxim put a knight on c5, 
The next move played by Black already indicates uh, that something went really wrong because here he played a move that you don't see very often in a chess game. He played bishop to g8 in order to force a decision with the e6 pawn. He cannot just, I mean, he has to do something here. Taking on e6 would be terrible because knight would arrive to c7. Um, the knight cannot move the rock, cannot move the queen, can bear, well, can go to b6, but, but basically cannot move either. Uh, moving the rook make no sense. The bishop cannot move the knight, cannot really move. The bishop cannot really move. I mean, so black has to find a way to unblock the position, otherwise better resign. So he played bishop g8, and of course Maxim did not take on f7 because that would be that would give black some freedom. Then he could move his e7 pawn. He wants Maxim wants to keep the pieces trapped, so he played bishop e5. And after fe6, knight f4 to bring the knight to g6. So black at first could uh, seem to be happy to exchange a few pieces and perhaps even grab the bishop pair, but actually Maxim White is really here to basically exchange any piece uh, except these two that he wants to stay uh, on the king's side forever, and this is what will happen. You will see that these two pieces basically, well, these two pieces just stay there forever for the whole game until Black resigned in that game. So, Rook h7 is forced here, which is also just like Bishop g8, not something you like to play. I mean, can you imagine that you need to play Bishop g8 and then Rook h7? This is really something you don't see very often. So, h5 to completely paralyze the king side, and here. Black has two extra pawns, but it, these pieces are basically, well, two pieces less because they cannot move. This bishop is not a piece less because, well, it can uh, be exchanged against the knight, but it's not going to solve the problem of the f8 bishop and the h7 rook. Um, so here we, definite, we are definitely talking about a position where black has uh, two extra pawns uh, at the cost of uh, two pieces. Here, Ding decided to play c5 and to try to find some activity and do something because he cannot just you cannot just sit and wait. I mean, it's gonna be too easy for White. He's gonna bring somehow, I don't know, maybe f4, maybe bring the rook, play a4 at some point, and maybe sack on b5 at some point. I mean, you cannot just play rook b8, rook a8, rook b8, rook a8 all game. So, uh, Ding tried to do something, but Maxim. Just played very simple moves. He's organizing his pieces. The black king is actually quite solid, but it's not gonna remain solid for too long. White, of course, opens the king side. Black played king c7, which is quite a smart idea. He's giving a pawn back in order to activate his uh, rook on a8, but Maxim doesn't care. He just plays rook b1, preventing rook a1. Rook a2, c3, and now Ding is targeting the c3 pawn, but as I said, Maxim is ready to do everything to exchange all, well, to exchange a few active pieces, a few uh, black active pieces. He wants black just to remain with these two guys here. You may also notice that knight takes a fate is a very open possibility. There is just a bishop uh, that is hanging in the position. But why is Maxim not taking it? Because if he takes it, then the rook h8, the rook is gonna escape. And well, it took, it did take, it, it is one extra piece for white. Uh, but actually, if you don't take the bishop, it is two extra pieces because the rook cannot move. So the bishop actually, it is not that the bishop here on f8 is worth, um, well, first of all, it is not worth three points like uh, a normal bishop. But it is also not worth one and a half or even half a point. It is actually uh, it is actually worth uh, minus because uh, it would be much better for Black to play this position without the bishop, because then he could, Black could take on g6, play rook h8, and move the rook. Uh, so this bishop is actually a very big handicap. It's almost a, it's almost if you have to count points for this bishop, then you have to add points to White and not to not to Black. So anyway, Maxim just uh, kept uh, the king side under control and exchanged queens. 
Now the danger is gone. King goes to d4, rook c2, rook e1. So black has two extra pawns, but there is nothing he can do with uh, with them because, well, he's playing only he's playing only with one piece here. Rook b8. Take takes rook h8, rook e b1. Nice tactics in case of takes. There would be check, uh, and then king c5 and rook b7 mate on the next move. So black played rook d2 check, king e3, rook a2, and after rook b6 check, although at first the computer says the position is equal, um, because at first he only sees, well, at first the, the engine counts a material and he sees that there is a perpetual check. So he gives, he assesses the position as equal 0, 0, 0. But actually the position is totally lost for black. He's under a mating net, the king is coming to c5. In the very best case, let's say in a, a dream for black here, uh, would be not to get mated and to only lose all the pawns on the large square, large square bishop, say rook takes e6, and then the white bishop collecting the other pawns, and get a totally lost endgame. This is, let's say, the best black could ever get from that uh, <laughs> from that position. So. Actually, uh, Ding Liren just uh, resigned here uh, just before the time control, so I moved 30 for 39. So that was really a brilliant game by by MVL. I think he's also happy with that game because I remember him showing showing it to to people in Gibraltar when he was he was giving a press conference one one evening there, and uh, he was asked uh, to show one of his best games, and he decided to show this one. A choice which I understand very well because that's that's really a great game. And again, look at these pieces. I <laughs> move thirty nine. This is uh, this is quite this is quite unbelievable. I mean, uh, somebody like Ding Liren uh, that normally never happens to him. But actually, it's not like he played such a terrible game. But Maxim simply played excellent, and I think that's one of the best possible examples. Uh, of uh, domination of the opponent's pieces. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this uh, first game and see you soon for the second one.